From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. If we think about our economy as a patient that goes to the doctor, the first question is, what does its symptoms tell us? If we go off the current symptoms, the outlook is clear. The economy is in dire health and it's in for a long road to recovery. By nearly every reliable measure of an economy's health, GDP, unemployment numbers, unemployment benefit claims, consumer confidence, all of those things are in the tank right now because of the pandemic. Many of us are living the day-to-day reality of it. Businesses and corporations are laying off employees in a bid for survival. Since mid-March, more than 3 million Canadians have lost their jobs. Another two and a half million have seen their working hours slashed. The worst we had ever seen in Canada, you got to go back to 1982. And in that, we lost 600,000 jobs, 610,000 jobs over 17 months. Here, we've lost three million in two months. It's just staggering. What about CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit? More than seven million Canadians have applied for and continue to depend on it. We are expanding the Canada Emergency Response Benefit to include people making up to $1,000 a month, seasonal workers, and people whose EI has recently run out. The Parliamentary Budget Office says Canada's government will be operating with a $260 billion deficit. Even the big banks in Canada have set aside nearly $11 billion in loan loss provisions, basically a rainy day fund, already assuming that a huge number of loans won't be paid back. Simply put, Canada's economy and most of the world's economy has collapsed in the space of two months. This is historic. So where is the bottom? Have we reached it? And what does recovery to dig ourselves out of this hole even look like? Today, we're talking to economist Jim Stanford. Jim is the director of the Center for Future Work, which studies employment and labor markets. He's also written on the economy for the Toronto Star. Jim, thanks for making the time for us. My pleasure. Thank you. So, you know, I have so many questions for you, but I'll start with this one. If you had just one word to describe the state of Canada's economy right now, what would that word be? Shocked. There's no doubt this is an absolutely unprecedented moment in our economy. Uh, I hate to say this, but it's actually a great time to be an economist because something like this has never happened before. And so we're kind of making it up as we go along. A fascinating thing to study. Yeah, well, in terms of understanding what's happening and what the consequences are going to be, obviously, without losing sight of the incredible hardship that people are experiencing, both from the disease itself, but the economic fallout of the disease. And it's also a fascinating time for an economist to be thinking, how do we get out of this? How do we repair the damage? How do we try to reconstruct something that is approaching normal? I don't think we'll ever be normal again, but something where people have a decent opportunity to work and produce and support themselves. And that's going to be a huge historic task that is going to take years. There's no doubt about it. Talking about history, you've compared this moment to the recession of 2008, 2009, even the Great Depression of the 1930s. But you've also said that this moment is something else entirely, that globally, we've never seen this kind of drop, this kind of crisis in our history. What makes this moment economically so different from anything else we've ever seen? Well, typically when the economy goes into a recession, Adrian, it it starts out with some bad news or some kind of negative development in one part of the economy. And then that kind of infects the confidence of consumers and businesses in other parts of the economy. And gradually, an economy that would normally be growing slows down and starts to shrink a bit. That's how a typical recession would occur. So we had a recession in the global financial crisis of 08 and 09, kind of looked like that. The bad news started in the financial sector. Uh, We had previous recessions in the early 90s and the early 80s, the same deal. This is a completely different mechanism that's occurring and a completely different order of magnitude for the scale of the contraction. In essence, this time, we deliberately shut down significant parts of the economy. It didn't just happen Mm -hmm. because of, you know, negative confidence or certain business decisions or anything. We did it deliberately. Probably about a fifth of the total economy had to be shut down in order to protect public health and stop contagion. I recommend that bars and restaurants stop in-person dine-in service and move exclusively to take out and delivery service as soon as possible and no later 
than midnight tonight. And so both the speed and the depth of this downturn were completely different, and the mechanism of it. It, it wasn't because people didn't want to work or there, there wasn't mm-hmm. a need for what we were doing. It was because we had to stop working for a while in order to try and save lives. For that reason, it is more comparable, frankly, to the Great Depression of the 30s. Certainly the level of unemployment that we're experiencing right now is a depression level unemployment. The official unemployment rate in April was 13%, but by my reckoning, the true rate of unemployment is more like 33% because the official rate doesn't count all kinds of people who aren't working but aren't showing up in that official unemployment tally. So that is like a depression. The difference is it took us years in the Great Depression to fall that far. In this case, we've fallen that far in in about three months. It's brand new terrain that we're on, and it's going to require, I think, some very innovative, powerful measures to try and get us out of it. And even the industries that were hardest hit and first hit, service industries, hospitality industries, usually, again, recessions don't happen like that. It doesn't hit those industries first. You're quite right. Usually retail and hospitality, restaurants, other personal services, they tend to be the followers in the economy, not the leaders. You know, usually you've got some kind of base or a foundation industry in Canada. It could be resources, it could be manufacturing, it could even be public sector activity and things like universities and so on that are sort of the the thing that gets the ball rolling in a regional or even a national economy. And then once some initial jobs and incomes have been created, well, the workers go out and spend that money. And that's where the retail and hospitality sectors get their business from. So typically, consumer services follow the pattern that's set elsewhere in the economy. This time, for the reasons that we just discussed, consumer services are setting the trend. It is there that the shutdowns had to occur because it's there that the face-to-face kind of hands-on nature of the service was the most dangerous in terms of the coronavirus. Now, it turned out, Adrian, that in fact, there were other parts of the economy that should have been shut down fast as well. You know, and we've seen Mm -hmm. some terrible outbreaks in places like meatpacking plants. There are new fears over meatpacking facilities where workers continue to get sick. The Washington Post reported today that there are 11,000 COVID-19 cases linked to three major meat producers. And I think we were slow. Employers and government were slow in recognizing the danger in those places. They did recognize immediately the danger of face-to-face contact in consumer-oriented industries, and that's where it is shut down first. So unusually for a recession, Workers in those sectors were the first ones to lose their jobs. And that's also unique. So we have a situation where young people are the hardest hit. Part-time workers are the hardest hit. Women have been hit harder than men because women are more likely to be working in those service sectors. So these are all aspects of this current downturn that make it unique and that will have to inform how we respond to it and try to repair the damage. The numbers really are staggering when you look at them by official counts. You know, Canada's lost more than 3 million jobs. Another... Like you said, two and a half million people have had their working hours reduced, probably even more than that. Do you think we've seen the worst of the job losses or are we just in uncharted territory here? Where is the bottom? Right. Lots of people are asking that, including, uh, of course, the financial investors who are trying to speculate on a stock market rebound. Once the bottom is reached, they're trying to guess. It's possible that we have reached bottom in terms of the immediate industries that had to be shut down quickly. You know, we did that and we did it completely and we did it fast. Now, the infection rates in most parts of Canada are abating. We still face, you know, very serious problems in Ontario and Quebec, of course, but elsewhere. Now, the community spread has almost been stopped and that's incredibly positive. So, if we manage this right and we don't slip back into repeated waves of infection that we can't control, then Mm. we should be able to start the recovery or rebuilding process. In that regard, we could have hit bottom. On the other hand, it could be, if we don't manage this well, that the worst is actually ahead of us. Because, you know, so far, the real damage has been done in those initial consumer-facing industries that got shut down. If we get things back up to speed, then the rest of the economy shouldn't suffer much more contraction than it already has. You know, in other sectors like transportation or uh, construction or manufacturing, they've had a significant downturn. But On the other hand, if we do experience repeated waves of infection that are uncontrolled, then you will see, I think, a deeper spread into the rest of the economy. It's hard to imagine that things could get any worse in retail and hospitality, but they could certainly get worse in those other industries that I mentioned. And that's where it's, I think, really, really important that we're so cautious 
and so careful in how the economy is reopened. And if we just think the worst is over and let's get back to business, then we will see uncontrolled spread. And that's where we could see not just second waves of infection, but a second wave of economic contagion that would actually make the numbers worse, hard as that may be to believe. Lockdowns again and businesses shuttering as we saw before. And, you know, remember, as terrible as those unemployment numbers are, you know, roughly one third of Canadians lost most or all of their work in those two months. That means two thirds of us were still working one way or another. Some of us working from home, some of us working in other workplaces that didn't have that consumer contact issue. So they continued working. It's certainly possible that things could get worse. We don't want that. We've managed to keep essential supplies like food still flowing, and we're going to have to keep doing that. So that's where, you know, I'm very worried about some of the arguments you hear, um, not mostly from economists, frankly. I think economists understand, but from some quarters who say, you know, the economic cost of this shutdown is too great. We have to get back to normal. And and we've certainly seen that argument take hold in America. Mm. And it's unwillingly that we're taking unemployment. We want to go back to work. Time for our state to be opened up. We're tired of not being able to buy the things that we need, go to the hairdressers, get our hair done. It's time to open up. It's so false, Adrian. There's nothing worse for the economy than allowing people to get sick in huge numbers. The best thing for the economy is absolutely to squash this virus as much as we possibly can. And a sort of premature or hasty or desperate reopening of work is actually only going to make things worse. This is where we we really have to follow the public health advice that we're getting that has proven so accurate and just be extremely cautious with how and where we put people back to work. Otherwise, you know, we'll be back in the soup again before we know it. I think every one of us is worried about that doomsday scenario, right? We think to some countries where the economic systems have completely failed of people having wheelbarrows of cash to pay for a loaf of bread. I mean, how do we know if we're in a depression? How do we avoid some of those doomsday scenarios? Well, the the depression risk arises if we respond to this negative shock that we've experienced, unprecedented, if we respond to it by saying, this is terrible, times are tough, we have to tighten our belts, we can't spend more money, whether we're individual households or whether we're the federal government, that's the kind of thinking that takes a recession and turns it into a depression, that Mm -hmm. takes a short-term negative shock and then puts it in a situation where the whole economy is trapped in a vastly underutilized situation, a big economic hole, and can't climb out of it. Because we need that spending power. That's the reality. Money is, in a way, the fuel that drives economic activity in our economy. And if money isn't being spent, there is no way that we're going to get people back to work. That's the reality. You know, obviously, we're going to encourage consumers to spend. That's part of the idea behind these huge emergency income support programs that the government, to its credit, has quickly brought in. We want businesses to spend as soon as they're able to, but they're going to be cautious about doing so. There's no doubt about it. And we definitely need government to spend because government has the financial resources and the capacity to sort of plan on a nationwide basis that we're going to need to sort of drag us back out of this hole. And that level of spending by government right now is unprecedented too. I mean, more than 7 million applicants to CERB, that's the emergency unemployment benefits. You know, the parliamentary budget says that the federal government is running a $260 billion roughly deficit. Of course, more spending is necessary because we need to keep things afloat. You need stimulus spending. How does Canada or any country for that matter get out of that loop? How do we avoid inflation, for instance? Well, inflation will only occur if, in fact, there's a total amount of spending in the economy that's vastly out of whack with the amount of production and the amount of goods and services that are available Mm. in the economy. So, yes, the government's pouring huge amounts of money into the economy through the CERB and other benefit programs. But at the same time, remember, huge amounts of money are coming out of the economy Mm. in the form of lost wages, lost profits, lost revenues for business. And it's clear the amount of money the government's putting in, while it's desperately needed, is not offsetting the amount of money that's coming off. So the true risk we face is not inflation, it's deflation. In fact, we are going to experience some deflation in coming months, which means an average decline in the overall level of prices. And it's also an unusual and very dangerous condition. It is something that's typified by a depression. That is to say, negative conditions that are so powerful and so long-lasting that 
everybody starts slashing prices for what they do, including wages, which is the price for labor. We really want to avoid deflation because deflation is a slope that takes you into a depression. And that's where I think all these concerns about, you know, a wheelbarrow full of cash to go and buy a loaf of bread like people had in Zimbabwe or whatever that you're hearing from some fiscal conservatives Mm -hmm. absolutely miss the mark. That isn't the risk. The risk is deflation. And if anything, we're going to need more government spending for a longer period of time in order to ensure that we don't get caught in that kind of a trap. Jim, this might be asking you to look through a bit of a crystal ball here, but do you think because of the reliance of of the spending that needs to happen to get the economy going again. Do you think this will usher in an era of bigger government? I mean, we're already seeing it with income benefits, even the idea of universal basic income, that's not that crazy anymore. Do you think people will be more accepting of that idea of bigger government? Oh, I think that's a really good point, Adrian. I think there has been a shift in how people perceive government. We've spent a couple months where government was saving our lives, basically, right? And we wanted government to run to the rescue, both to stop the contagion, of course, but also to help help people bridge the gap that they were experiencing economically because of the loss of so many jobs. So I haven't heard a lot of those kind of traditional conservative calls for small government and downsizing and cutting red tape. It's government and what it can do that's saving our bacon right now. And that isn't going to suddenly disappear. Even if we manage to get the infection down and we get to gradually reopen the economy, the reality is the private sector is too shocked and too damaged and too, in a way, fragmented to lead the sort of nationwide reconstruction that we're going to need. The historical analogy that I've been using is to look back to the end of the Second World War, where government and the whole country was fighting an enormously important task. We never stopped during the war to say, oh, we can't afford this war, we'll just let the Nazis take over, right? We threw every resource at it that we could. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that war, we faced a a big risk. We could have slipped back into the depression that we had been until the war came along. But uh, government said, no, we're not going to let that happen. And they, they demobilized the military spending, but they ramped up other types of spending, including expansion of our modern social welfare programs and infrastructure projects like the Trans Canada Highway and the St. Lawrence Seaway, other, other ways that permanently increase the role of government in our economy in order to make sure we didn't slip into depression again. I think we're going to need something like that. I think we're going to need a post-COVID Marshall Plan, if you like, where government commits for years to continue mobilizing resources, to take the lead in investments. Obvious place to start, our healthcare system. It's performed very well in most areas, but it needs repair and restoration. And in some areas, like long-term care homes, it was a disaster. This is the exact moment for government to come in and say, we're going to completely redo how we manage long-term care. We're going to make it part of Medicare, which it should have been all along. And we're going to build safe, fair, accessible homes and services for them. Other kinds of public services, lots of public infrastructure, Direct public sector hiring is going to be essential to perform all kinds of community services because there's no way we're going to go from 33% unemployment where we are today back to something like full employment. People need jobs. Yeah. We're going to need millions of jobs and a good chunk of that work is going to have to come from the public sector. Once the ball gets rolling, you know, if in fact we get those commitments to infrastructure and expanded services from government at all levels, not just the federal government, then we get some of those positive spinoff effects that we talked about earlier. That's when you'll get income flowing. That's when you'll get workers going back to stores and restaurants and personal services, and there'll be a restoration of positive momentum. But somebody has to take the lead. And the only part of our economy today that has the resources and the, in a way, the farsighted planning potential to do that is going to be government. So there's no doubt we're going to see a bigger role for government, probably permanently. It is interesting that you don't really hear many calls for austerity right now, as you mentioned. That debate isn't happening on a major level like we usually see. Yeah, we haven't heard them yet. I guess I would attach the qualifier yet, Adrian. And I think that it will not be long before we start to hear them. And we have heard some, you know, from some prominent, I'd say, expected quarters. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, for example, lecturing governments internationally that they have to mm-hmm. downsize after this COVID. And again, invoking the same arguments about hyperinflation and fiscal collapse and hitting the debt wall etc., etc., arguments that have been proven false because lots of countries in the world have incurred 
huge debts, not just mm. for the coronavirus. There's still places like Japan, which are running up huge public debts every year because of things like the aging population and the shrinking workforce. So Japan's debt as a share of GDP is about 250% today. That's about eight times as much as our federal government's share of debt, our debt ratio here in Canada, and it hasn't led to collapse. In fact, it's been very helpful in keeping Japan's economy going despite those pressures. We're going to have exactly the same thing happening here. And we will hear from those, I think, traditional quarters that government debt is bad, that big government is bad, that income support programs are bad, arguing that, well, because people can get $500 a week now for CERB, nobody is going to want to work anymore. That's nonsense, frankly. You know, people are desperate to get back to work, not just for the money. I think invoking this, I would say, outdated idea that government programs somehow ruin the economy is just not going to wash. Millions of Canadians, this is an interesting point, millions Mm -hmm. of Canadians are now getting government income support. So the whole idea that income support is for losers, you know, or for people who've been addicted to welfare or some of those old negative stereotypes, that isn't going to wash anymore because millions of Canadians have experienced it now. It's turned on its head, yeah. Exactly. Understand why those programs are there. So I think the traditional rhetoric about bashing government, bashing welfare, et cetera, et cetera, is is going to ring pretty hollow. And I think most Canadians are grateful for what government has done, and most Canadians are going to expect government to continue playing a very active role in the next steps of our reconstruction. On a micro level, people are definitely thinking about our economy. You know, I want my local restaurant to survive, so I'm going to order takeout there. But on a larger, more macro level, how does the government boost consumer spending, especially when there are so many people who don't have jobs, aren't really pulling in an income right now? Yeah, that's one particularly tricky aspect of this economic moment. There's no doubt about it. Again, how the rebuilding from this recession is going to be fundamentally different than from previous ones. In the past, you believed in something called stimulus, right? You wanted to stimulate more spending. And so things like tax cuts and grants and other forms of spending to help get the economy going were the kind of tricks of the trade. But at this moment, we don't want people to go out spending. (laughs) We're still at a stage where we're telling them to stay home for a bit. So in that regard, conventional stimulus isn't what we need, at least not at this moment. Once the health emergency abates a bit, then, you know, we'll be more, I guess, open to those kinds of traditional measures. And again, I think this is one of the other reasons why the reliance on government to do the job directly, rather than just kind of grease the wheels a bit with a bit of stimulus is going to be so important in this recovery. I think about the U.S. too. I mean, the job loss numbers there are off the charts as well. The U.S. Department of Labor reports uh, 20.5 million jobs, which given their population size tracks with ours. Since the Canadian economy is so tied to the American economy, is any rebound of ours really still dependent on how the picture looks down south, you think? Oh, absolutely. And not just for those kind of economic links as well. I mean, of course, we experienced in Canada, this is our biggest neighbor, longest undefended border in the world, huge two-way flows of people and goods. And it turns out that people coming in from America was the major source of international transmission into our community. So for both epidemiological reasons and economic reasons, we're going to have to watch very closely what happens in America for political reasons, too, frankly. I mean, I'm I'm frightened by some of the images that you see of these kind of populist outbreaks in America showing Mm -hmm. up with guns at crowded rallies to rail against supposed dictatorship government controls. I mean, that's the stuff of dystopia. And Mm -hmm. it's exposing the weakness of the kind of social and economic system in America. So part of me wants to protect ourselves as much as possible from that. And to some extent we can by, I would say, focusing our rebuilding efforts inward on developing things that we can do in Canada, including infrastructure Mm -hmm. and public services, but also even jobs, manufacturing, for example, right? This is another issue that's been turned on its head by COVID. Until recently, the received wisdom was we're part of a globalized economy. If someone can do it cheaper elsewhere in the world, then they should. We should welcome that. Well, it turns out that in a national emergency, you want to be able to produce a lot of stuff yourself. Yes. Manufacturing, yeah. For strategic national security reasons. And now we have to interpret national security more widely to include things like public health, not just military and and energy and that kind of thing. So, you know, there's a sector where we may want to see more made in Canada production as a result of COVID. And in other ways, I think our economy will have to become more self-sufficient 
On the other hand, we can't ignore the fact that America is our biggest neighbor and we cannot possibly think that we can insulate ourselves completely. I hope that they manage to get both the infection under control and some of the political and economic strains, but I frankly am not optimistic on either count. And I think it will be a big challenge for Canada's government to figure out how to manage that going forward. You know, we will keep the border closed for a while, but, you know, how long can that happen? And and what are the long-term implications for our place in the world? Those are absolutely unanswered questions that even an economist's crystal ball can't help mm-hmm. answer. This is a recovery of years, potentially decades, right? Absolutely years. I hope it's not decades. It will be years if we do it right. Then I would say over the next five to eight years, we could get Canada's economy back to something like full capacity. We weren't at full capacity even before the pandemic hit. The economy was underutilized and was slowing down. So, you know, in a way, we've got an even bigger job to get to full capacity. But again, I think the post-World War II analogy is a good one. We had the risk of slipping back into depression. And instead, thanks, I would say, largely to a very expansive vision from government and other stakeholders for building an economy, building new industries, building infrastructure, providing new services. We didn't slip back into depression. In fact, we entered a a quarter-century golden age that, in a way, was the most prosperous part of Canada's economic history, the most prosperous chapter in our history. So, you know, I'm not saying that will happen again, But I think if we view this as the challenge that's required and recognize the ingredients that are going to have to come into play, then we could absolutely usher in a period of nation building, society strengthening reconstruction that leaves us better off at the end of the day than we were before we ever heard of this coronavirus. Maybe a light at the end of the tunnel. Jim, thank you so much for breaking it down for us. And I hope that light isn't the train coming the other way, Adrian. (laughs) Thank you for having me on. And that is economist Jim Stanford on where we even go from here in terms of the big picture of the economy. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.